when we say yes, that's when it begins. That we take a very rapid walk back up the ladder of creation back into infinity. They found a way to codify it and transmit it through the centuries and the millennia. They asked the big questions about who we are and what's the purpose of life and what's the universe made of and why are we unhappy and on and on. And they came up with and they came up with extraordinary set of answers. And they said that in the big picture, that the universe is vibrational in nature, meaning there is an up and there is a down and there is a hot and there is a cold. Duality was at its center. But then they said this vibration comes from God. It is of God. And this vibration exists even where there is evil and where, where there is ignorance. Because at the heart of this vibrational creation is the infinite intelligence of God itself. And every now and then this assumes the form of flesh and bones and walks among us. This is the big picture. And these, uh, those of you that come to Sunday service every week, you'll notice that these are the first five topics of the Sunday service. And then they went into the mechanism of it and using words like karma and reincarnation and dharma and so on. And then they went into the mechanics of getting out of it, which we collectively call as yoga. But this first five or six weeks, we still focus on the big picture. And today's topic is among, the, among, among all the teachings of these set of rishis, which is called Sanatana Dharma, an ancient, unbroken set of practices to live the life so that we transcend the human condition. That's the long translation of these small words, believe it or not. Among all the concepts that have been imported from Sanatana Dharma, the concept of avatar, a divine incarnation, is among the most mysterious, misunderstood, treated with suspicion, because it, it has no place to land outside of the context of where um, it was first articulated. Now, before I go ahead with my talk, I wanted to say this big picture that I just said, those five concepts of the big picture, uh, a very useful book on that is this one that Riemann wrote, at least to my way of thinking, it is about the great big concepts of Sanatana Dharma and how it can be applied to us. I'll be quoting from this book. It's called The Once and Future Christ. When Paramahansa Yogananda, whose teachings we follow here, when he first came to the United States, about four years after his arrival, he wrote his first book. It was called The Science of Religion. And the first few paragraphs in that book basically say the following. It says that the motivation behind everything that we do, absolutely everything, meaning every action, either in the mind or through the body, serves exactly two purposes, no less and no more. One purpose is to be happy. And the other purpose is to prevent unhappiness. And that's it. That's Sukha Prapti Dukha Nivritti. That's the uh, official Sanatana Dharma source for that, is you want to be happy and prevent unhappiness. Now both individually and the great philosophers of the world have offered us three ways of looking at this particular aspect of human condition. First one is to say, well, everything's random. 
The universe is just a bunch of random particles subject to gravity and inertia, electricity and magnetism. The human brain is just an accident of biochemistry and the consciousness is an emergent phenomenon and our great endeavors to do art and compose poetry and express love are simply dopamine and serotonin masquerading as feelings. <laughs> this is certainly one view. And if we look at the universe through the senses and through measurement, then this is the testimony that the universe reflects back to us, that that's all there is to it. And so in terms of human potential, it says that whether you feel happy or not is completely a random accident. In other words, there is no difference between you and a doorknob. They are exactly the same. Now, the second viewpoint on this, which is significantly more elevated, it says that the purpose of the universe is so that I can try to achieve happiness and I can do so by doing good things. As long as I do good things, love other people, create wealth and share it amongst others, take care of my body and live in harmony with everyone else, forgive people, be stern and loving uh, to my children and on and on, eat vegetarian food or whatever the fad of the day is in terms of intake of nutrition, go to church and on and on, then I will create happiness for myself. Now, this, this viewpoint, it's a very well-established philosophy across all cultures. In Sanskrit, the name for this philosophy is Mimamsa. It's this transactional approach to life and happiness. And it's almost intuitive, almost, but not quite. I'll come to that in a moment. And here in the West, it's had many incarnations. Uh, the most recent of which that I know of is something called as the prosperity gospel. It says that you can have it all. You really can have it all as long as you do this, this, and this. It doesn't take too much thinking to see the flaw in this particular argument. When I was around 11 years old, my brother had met with an accident at the time, and we didn't have enough money to afford private health care. And the government of India guarantees uh, healthcare, and I enclose that in quotes to kind of say what I think of it. Uh, they are called government hospitals. They are, they are government run. And then my, my, my parents took me to see my brother, and we went through what here in the US would be called the emergency room. And there were all these people really in various stages of extraordinary distress, and the fragility of the human body and the mind's reaction to it was laid bare. Uh, you know, there was screaming and blood and this and that. I won't go, I won't delve too much into it in terms of painting a word picture, but I think you all get what I'm saying. And as I walked through it and then came back, it, it really, I didn't know where to put it in my head. Uh, that, you know, when you're 11 years old, Vulnerability and mortality is not part of your mental picture, generally. Uh, so I distinctly remember spending the next seven or eight years. I was a voracious reader, so I read and read and read and thought, let me find at least one life where they actually were happy. And I, I, you know, I looked at scientists and spiritual figures and rich people and uh, prime ministers, all of those. And I couldn't find a single one at all. And you know, I, it, it's, it's a good exercise in, in trying to figure out the human condition. Look around, go to Wikipedia, what, YouTube, whatever, and, and see if there is one that is really perfect in the outer manifestation. It's, I'm just not talk, talking about physical health, but even mental well-being is so fragile that our mental well-being is usually gated on two or three things that can be taken away at any point. Maybe the love of somebody, the sense of belonging to a tribe or a community, um, or some semblance of uh, control or adoration that we receive from others, and so on. And if even one of them is pulled from us, we go through 
enormous mental trauma, isn't it? So Swami Kriyananda says, commenting on this one, he says, man thinks that by moral maxim alone, he can find happiness. He might as soon expect to pick his way over a windy plain with the help of a small unshielded candle. He thinks to find the way by his own strength alone, and belatedly, recognizing his own helplessness, he waits pathetically to be carried, not even caring who the porter is, the priest, the soothsayer, the palmist, so long as this fellow pilgrim promises to do all the work for him. <laughs> so, so much for the second view of life. This says that I am better than the doorknob, but then I really cannot, it, it's so hard to walk that knife's edge when everything is so fragile all around you. Now, the great masters of every religion, and especially the teachings of Sanatan Dharma, gave us a third way of looking at my relationship vis-a-vis -vis the doorknob and of happiness. And here's how it goes. That in, in the Bible, it says that we are made in the image of God. And that's, that's an interesting thing. It's frequently, this thing is confused by representing God as someone that looks at us. And thereby, we miss the point. The relationship is actually other way. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your father in, uh, who is in heaven is perfect. Right? It's, it, it has to go the other way. The Bhagavad Gita delves into this in a little bit more of a detail. And in chapter 2, Krishna tells Arjuna, he says, Nainam chindanti shastrani nainam dahati pavakaha nachayenam kledayantyapo nanu shoshayati marutaha. It says, the essence of who we really are is not destroyed by any weapons, meaning anything material out there. It is not burned by fire. It is not even wet by water, nor disturbed by wind. And then it says, Ajonitya shashvatoyam purano na hanyate hanyamane sharire. That it is always present, omnipresent, not just always present, but also not just eternal, but also omnipresent. And it has predated everything that is material and doesn't die even when the carrier, the body, dies. And by and large, this reasoning applies even to the doorknob. Oh, it's tattva masi, that I, you, the doorknob, are all a spark of the same divine consciousness. There is another quote from the Bhagavatam. I'll just translate it for you. It says that our divine body is built of three things. It's built of um, eternity, wisdom, and infinite bliss. Imagine that the material body is built of all kinds of things, carbon and oxygen, but the divine body is built of eternity, satya, wisdom, jnana, eternal bliss, ananta, ananda, eh, sorry, infinite bliss. So this is a completely different way of the previous uh, one, that everything's random or everything's on a knife edge, and you've got to do this, otherwise there is eternal consequences. How? And this also implies another interesting thing, that the happiness that we seek, see, the whole question began with happiness. And this says that the happiness that we seek is neither random nor something to be acquired, which are the first two viewpoints, but it says you are already that which you seek. So the entire progression to happiness, to the extent that it's even a progression, is that it's a revelation, it's a purification, not acquisition or competence. Okay, so this, this turns the, the whole equation on its head. Then how do we reconcile our condition right now with what this one says, ajonitya shashvatoyam purano nahanyate hanyamani sharire, eternal, omnipresent, unbreakable, not dying even when the vehicle, the body, dies. So, um, in, in this book, Once and Future Christ, let me quote it uh, for you. Uh, Riemann says, 
The true and pure nature of divine intelligence within all beings is masked from us and all objects in at least two ways. Now, now pay attention, this is very deep. First, most objects in creation are not yet self-aware. This is how the question of doorknob is disposed of, because it's not yet there. It needs to go from a doorknob to a dung beetle, to a dinosaur, then come to us and acquire higher and higher levels of self-awareness. Second, Riemann continues, most humans, though possessing the potential for self-awareness, are mostly preoccupied with using this intelligence for material gain and ego affirmation and protection. But our preoccupation, see this is the saving grace, our preoccupation with ego protection is tinged with the memory of perfection. That somewhere, in fact, our ego preoccupation is simply a misguided attempt to recapture that perfection, that we come back life after life, going around in circles, trying to tinker against overwhelming evidence, trying to tinker with life to achieve perfection. It takes many, many, many lifetimes to say to even be here. Right? As uh, Yogananda said, it takes very, 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 very good karma to even have the desire to know God that we've gone through all of those, through dim corridors of awakening consciousness. We've gone through that, and we are here. And so for this particular state of consciousness, there is a story told in India about, there is a man from Gandhara, it says. Gandhara is past, it is deep in Afghanistan today. And it was, it's a, they use that term because you have to cross the Himalayas. It's a faraway place. Not here, but way over there. So there is a man from Gandhara who was robbed. And the, the thieves took all of his possessions, and they tied his hands and blindfolded him and left him in a forest. So this poor man really, really, really remembered where he was from, and he really wanted to get back. And so he walked around, bumped into a tree, fell down, bruised himself, took rest for a day, got up again, went around, bumped into a different tree, fell into a stream, whatever, went round and round and round in circles. There was a great deal of energy in what he did, and he was incredibly creative. Every now and then he, sp he smelled a flower and thought, ah, I have arrived only to realize that he hadn't made any progress. And eventually, eventually, he realized, ooh, Maybe I'm not seeing things. Maybe I'm not acting as if I'm free. My hands are tied. And then once that thought came, another man who was also from Gandhara, he knew how to get from here to there. He came and he untied this man's bonds, removed his blindfold and said, come, follow me. I will take you to where you want to go. This is what an avatar does. And again, to quote Hriman, uh, the teaching of Sanatan Dharma says that the Son of God dwells in all souls as the Christ consciousness. It stands to reason that there must be some souls who have realized this fact. It would also be reasonable to imagine that at least some of them would either stick around or come back later to tell the rest of us the good news. That's, that's the purpose of the avatara. Avatara literally means somebody that has not descended, but fallen down, meaning for them, it's a downgrade. They got demoted. Okay? They, they worked all the time to get promoted, but they got demoted. So the defining feature, this is where you know, I talked about the cosmic aspect of the avatar, but now getting it into the personal aspect, the defining feature of the avatar is this compassion, is the, is the love that they bring, and this thing saying, oh, you poor thing, you've been blindfolded and hands are tied and you're walking around in the forest. I know exactly where you want to go. Come follow me and to put in the words of another master here, come follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. You see, that's the purpose of the avatar. 
And then how do we relate to such a person if Jesus Christ walked among us? Or if we were Arjuna walking with Krishna? Or as many of us are here, disciples of Paramahansa Yogananda, another avatar, how do we relate to them? The temptation is to relate to them as a personality. And Swami Kriyananda writes in one of his talks, the most noteworthy feature of master's life, by master he was referring to Paramahansa Yogananda, the most noteworthy feature of master's life was his constant refusal to accept our constant thought of him as a person, as an individual. He would always hold up before us the ideal that, that it was God who is expressing through him, and it was God whom we loved. Avatars come to show who we can be, and so the requirement is to do our best to meet them at their level, not meet them at our level. It's not about understanding them. It's not about establishing a human relationship with them. Even a relationship of human love is not only not sufficient, but often it misses the point entirely. But it's about attunement to their consciousness. So there are a few things we can do to get to that attunement. It's all about attunement. Come follow me, and we follow them. The following is a metaphor for tuning into their consciousness. You know, we read, uh, let me now uh, particularize this fairly generic discussion to Yogananda. That's, that's the avatar, that's the guru that we follow. And if that's not you, then substitute in that place whoever it is that represents such a consciousness for you. So we read books about Yogananda. Why would we read it? Sometimes we, not about books by, uh, or Swami Kriyananda, the disciple guru, they are all tuned into the same consciousness, so I'll use uh, them interchangeably. We read often to understand them. I really want to get what they are saying. Or often, uh, I, I used to do this, and I certainly still do this, is we open the book because we look for a certain answer that we are seeking. A, how often do you get up in the morning, open the book, and say, oh, this is the perfect page. It represents uh, what I wanted. But then there is another way of reading. Uh, Padma was pointing this out to us on Friday, that uh, she had, sorry to speak about you in the third person, uh, but she had uh, taken a couple of boxes of Swamiji's correspondence to her and read it, and the way she put it was that getting into the mind of Swamiji was so liberating. See, we read not so much to understand or get an answer, but we read saying what is being said is entirely right. What is being said is divine. What is being said is true, satya. And if I read it that way, then perhaps I'll attune myself to that infinite stream of consciousness. See what I'm saying? So get into the mind of the master through their writings. Get into the mind of the master through their techniques. Practice it. There is certainly a mechanical aspect to the practice of Kriya Yoga or Raja Yoga. This is the teachings that Yogananda brought. But behind the mechanical aspect, it gets our consciousness to a stage where it becomes eligible to open up to infinity. Tataha kshiyate prakashavaranam is what it says in the Yoga Sutras. In this way, the veil hiding the inner light becomes a little thinner. So it's, all, it's again about attunement. Being instruments of their work, whether it's moving around chairs in the temple or cleaning it or doing other aspects of whatever the Guru's work is, is again another absolutely wonderful way of attunement. Without attunement, we are really subject to interpreting the infinite in finite terms. And anything that's finite is being filtered through the ego. So it's, we are bound to get it wrong. You see, that's, that's the thing. So it, and attunement is, 
is not one of doing, 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 doing. It is that too, but it needs to be tinged, permeated with something else. And I'll, I'll end with this. When Yogananda meets his guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar, it's in a crowded, narrow alley in a very ancient city called Kashi. This city, to the best that anybody knows, has always existed. I mean, there is no historical record of Kashi being a mound of some inanimate thing. It, it has, so it is like Damascus or Jerusalem, all those great other human settlements, which seem to have been here as far back as anyone can, could care to recall. And in this crowded marketplace, Yogananda has just had an extraordinary experience. Divine Mother spoke to him that morning, saying, you will meet your master. And then he sees Sri Yukteswar way back, uh, the end of the room where uh, you know, Bruce or Scott are standing. He, he sees his master, it's a leonine head. Yogananda is around 16 years old. And if you look at his picture, he's a very slender youth. He has that uh, deep inner discipline that, of a Hatha Yogi. And he has practiced all of those esoteric practices by now. You can imagine that there is a spring in his step, and his enthusiasm to find his guru is boundless. And he has seen that face again and again over the last two and a half years. And then he sees him over there. And then he goes. A lot of things happen. I'll skip over those parts. He goes and falls at his guru's feet. And then there is a wordless exchange of love and connection between them. We don't know how long that lasted in this crowded alley of an Indian marketplace in the eternal city of Kashi. It's a 16 year old boy and his 54 year old guru, for both of whom time is merely a construct. It's not even real. And they are sitting there connecting consciousness to consciousness. And Sri Yukteswar gets up, takes Yogananda by the hand, and then takes him to his apartment, which is, which is set on a small, bluff, a, a slight cliff on the Ganges River. And they sit in the balcony. And they sit across each other. And then Sri Yukteswar says, uh, I will give you my hermitages and all that I possess. And Yogananda looks at him and says, sir, I have come to you for wisdom and God contact. And this is the exchange that takes place. And visualize them sitting in this uh, probably an ancient house overlooking the, uh, the, the Ganga River. And then it's noon, four and a half hours pass. And the noonday sun becomes less bright, and there is the half veil of darkness of approaching twilight. And I know for a fact that from those kinds of houses, you can see a brilliant sunset. So they are viewing the sunset four and a half hours. They've said nothing. Sri Yukteswar has said, I'll give you all of my material possessions. And Yogananda says, I don't want them. Four and a half hours later, Sri Yukteswar says, his eyes holding unfathomable tenderness, I give you my unconditional love. And he gazes at Yogananda with childlike trust. Will you give me the same unconditional love? And Yogananda says, I will love you eternally, Guru Deva. This conversation, at some point, needs to happen between each of us and the avatar. That's the whole point of this. They come in already filled with compassion and love. Whether they offer or not, the offer is certainly implicit that if what we seek from them is some form of achievement, whether material or esoteric, we'll be met with limited success with that, far more than any other thing that we might pursue, for sure. I will give you all my hermitages and possessions. What do we answer at that point? And then we sit. Okay, this, this is my declaration to you, Guru Deva. And then we sit through perhaps even the prime of our lives, through the noontime all the way to dusk. We do, and then the avatar speaks and says, this is what I want from you. I'm already giving it to you. That's the whole point of me being here. Will you give me the same? And when we say yes, that's when it begins, that we take a very rapid 
walk back up the ladder of creation back into infinity. So that is why the avatars are here. And the promise has been given. It's a majestic promise. In the Gita, it says, yada yadahi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyutthanam adharmasya tadatmanam srijamyaham paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya cha dushkritam dharma samsthapan arthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. Again and again, to destroy vice and protect the virtuous, I come, this is God saying, I come, I send my emissaries again and again. And when I say, God is saying, when I say, come with me, will you listen? Om Shanti Shanti Shanti.